once again I return to European Country Antiques, my favorite antique store here in Cambridge. Now the owner, Ed, said that he had a new shipment in, including these tall, narrow cupboards made out of pine. Now I like the flat panel and the nice little moldings, and the pine looks great. Let's see what he's got. Hey, hey Norm, how's it going? Good. I see you. New shipment, huh? Yeah, you're late. Where have you been? I hope I haven't waited too long. Uh, no, I've got a few left. All right. You saw the one in the window? Yeah, I like that Good. one. I like the size of it and okay. the look. Take a look at this one. A little bit smaller, narrower. A little bit narrower, and it has raised panels. And uh, yeah, now these are um, cupboards that are made from old doors. Um, so this is new? That's new from old wood, yeah. Okay, and just the doors are the thing that it starts with. Right. Hmm. Well, that one's a little bit narrow. Um, what else do you have? Let me show you another one down here. It's a little bit wider. Uh, the same two doors. Now, what do people use these for? Well, you know, oftentimes in a bathroom, sometimes in a kitchen, mm -hmm. but you know, you get a lot of storage and a small footprint. Right. Now, like That's the other it. one, this one has the door over the sides, no face frame. This one has a nice flat panel. Look at the age of that pine. Yeah, great color. And an applied molding, but it's a little small. It's kind of short. Short. Yeah, I got one more over here you can take a look at. Boy, as usual, you are packed. Yeah, you got to keep it full. I'm heading out uh, next week, in fact. Okay, yeah. Now, this is a little bit closer to the size that I would like to work with. A little bit wider and taller. Again, a flat panel door with a, boy, that's a nice applied molding. Now, do people ever put mirrors in these? You know, it's a great idea. No one's done it yet. I don't know. Can you figure out a way to put it maybe on the inside? Well, that would be a good idea. I guess I could get a full-length mirror, and maybe if I made a molding like the one that's holding the panel in place, that would hold the mirror in place. Yeah, the full length would be great. And this is just about, about the right depth. Well, you know, the fun of coming here, Ed, is to haggle with you. Ah, uh, don't hurt me, dog. This could take a while. Well, I wonder how much Ed will give us for our version of the bathroom cupboard. Here it is, with a few changes from that antique that we saw. I thought that the top of Ed's piece was a little too plain, so I added this cornice molding. The door is exactly the same. In fact, I had some knives cut to make these moldings on our new molding machine, which I'll show you later. On the inside, I added a full-length mirror held in place with a wooden frame. And I set up a series of adjustable shelves rather than fixed shelves. Now, Ed's piece had old pine boards exposed on the inside, and I'm afraid that would catch fine linens or clothing. So what I've done is lined the inside of the cabinet with some birch plywood, which can be painted or just a clear coat put on it. Now, the piece is made out of reclaimed pine, and it looks good here, but look what I started with these old boards that look totally useless. Now, if you have any of these around, don't throw them away. And if you see some in a dumpster when you're driving down the road, ask if you can have them, because you'd hate to know how much I paid for these boards. Now, there's a lot of steps and a lot of work to take them from this to this. But look at the color of the wood. It's just great. Now, the first step is to remove the bits of iron. And you've seen me use this tool before. It's a metal detector like you would see in an airport. You turn it on and you just run it over the board and it picks up every little piece of iron. For instance, there's a nail right there. Now to remove them, I use a lot of different tools and all, sometimes I take a nail set and drive it through, pliers, and even a nail puller. And if they're at the end of a board, I often just cut it off. It takes time. All right, well, there's probably a half a dozen nails in this board, so I'll get back to that in a minute. But once the nails are out, that's not enough before you run it through your planer. There's a lot of grit on these from being handled and stored. If you run it through your planer, it's going to knock the edge off. Now, there's several things to remove that grit you could do. You could vac it, take a big scraper and scrape off the top layer, or you could take a belt sander and hand sand it. But since I have a wide belt sander, I'm going to use that. And what I'll do is run it through with a very aggressive belt, like a 60 grit. But before we use any power tools, let's talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. 
Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Well, that takes care of the surfaces. Now I have to deal with the edges, which also have a lot of grit. So I usually measure the board at its narrowest point. Sometimes these boards are tapered. Here I'll set my fence at seven and three quarters, rip one edge, move the fence, and rip the other edge. It took me about a half a day to clean up enough boards to build the prototype, and then I cut pieces out of those, sometimes going around defects and some of the nail holes. Here are three pieces which will make up the top, and I need to do a glue up. If I slide the pieces together, you can see that they're not quite tight and straight. But that can be taken care of at the joiner. I don't think I'm going to bother with any biscuits on these joints. These boards are pretty flat, and they'll line up when I put them in the clamps. Okay, we'll set that aside to cook for a while. Now, last night, I glued up the side panels, and they've been removed from the clamps. And the first thing I want to do is scrape off any of the glue that squeezed out. Only now will I put a piece of wood through the surface planer to smooth it up. All the grit is gone. Let's take a look at the prototype. Each side panel requires a dado near the bottom to receive the bottom shelf and a rabbit along the back edge to receive the back plywood. To make the dado, I've set up the stack cutter for the width of the plywood bottom and set my rib fence six inches to the outside. This is a fancy device that gives me nothing more than a sacrificial strip, which avoids the possibility of my expensive dado hitting the rip fence. And with that, I can make the rabbit. Let's take another look at the prototype. On the outside, we see the three quarter inch pine boards, the panel. On the inside, we have one quarter inch thick plywood with holes in it for the adjustable shelf pins. Now because those are dissimilar materials, I don't want to glue one to the other. I'm just going to set it on dry and nail it with some 5 8 inch brads only along the back edge. Now I'm ready to make the holes for the shelf support pins. And I'm going to use this homemade jig. It has a fence that I can adjust for the distance I want the holes in from the edge. There's a center line that I align to the center line of the panel. And I clamp this in place so that it won't move as I do the operation. Now this will give me about 25 holes, but I can extend the line of holes by moving the jig. Once it's clamped in place, I turn to my router with a 5 8 inch collar and a quarter inch bit. This piece of plywood is for the bottom shelf, and I've made a couple notches to let the face frame fit by. By now, the blank for the top had cured, so I took it out of the clamps, sanded it, and sized it. I need to have a dado along each edge to receive the side panels. I'm going to use my router to do that. I've set up a guide fence against which this flat side of the router base will run. The layout from the edge of the fence to the far side of the line is equal to the distance from this edge to the far side of the cutter. I'll make one pass, slide the fence over, and make the second pass. Now, 
with a straight edge across the back edge of the top, I've made a rabbet to receive the quarter inch plywood back. Now we're starting to put the carcass together. And because the bottom shelf is plywood and the side is pine, I don't want to glue the whole joint, just the front edge. So bring the pieces together. Make sure that the edge of the notch is flush to the front edge of the side piece. And I'll secure it in place with some one and a quarter inch brads. For the top, I glue the entire length of the joint because both materials are the same. Slip it into the dado, line it up, and again secure it with some brads. Now for the back. Glue all the way around in the rabbits. And even though this is only a quarter inch thick piece of plywood, it adds a lot of strength to the case. Keep it from racking. In order to build nice flat panel doors like this with applied moldings, you need thick styles and rails for the door. In this case, an inch and a sixteenth thick. I was unable to get thick pine, so I simply laminated some material together, both for the door and for the face frame of the cabinet. I'm starting to work on the face frame here. And the first step is to make a groove in the back side of the styles to receive this quarter inch plywood. It'll hold the plywood tight up against the pine. And as the pine expands and contracts, the plywood will float in the groove. To connect the face frame styles to the rail, I'm cutting some slots for some number 20 biscuits. Okay, a little bit of glue right along the edge of the side piece. I'm going to slip this style in place and secure it with some one and a half inch brads. Okay, now we're ready for the rail before the other style goes on. And now I've got to bring all the pieces together. Before I nail the opposite style, I'm just going to clamp this rail in place. Make sure it's nice and tight. With the case built, I'm now ready to build a door. These pieces are my rails and styles. The first step is to put a groove in each piece to receive the panels. The rails and styles are connected with mortise and tenon joints. So now I'm machining a mortise in the styles, it's a quarter inch wide and it falls right in that groove that I just machined at the table saw. Now I'm beginning to form tenons on the ends of the rails that will fit into those mortises. Because the groove is not in the center, I need a couple different setups. The first one is to make the shoulder cut on this 7 16 inch side. Now I'll lower the blade and make the shoulder cut on the other side. For the last few minutes, I've set up and began nibbling away the material to form a haunch tenon on the top and bottom rail. It's along the edge on the opposite side of the groove. Now the cheek cuts, and it's going to take two setups once again because the tenon is offset.
Here's one of the door panels, a glue up of pine boards, planed and sanded to 9 sixteenths of an inch thick. Now the groove is only a quarter of an inch thick, so with my dado cutter I can make a rabbit to leave me a quarter inch tongue. For the door assembly, a little bit of glue on the tenon itself, and I've already put some in the mortise. I'll we'll slip these to in place, and then we'll do the panels, which don't have any glue. All right, with glue on the tenons and in the mortises for the other style, we'll set that in place and then clamp everything up. Well, I think I'll let this cook overnight right here on the workbench. Tomorrow we'll make some moldings to go around these panels, the cornice and the base, and then we'll finish the project inside and out. Now, good morning. I got started today by taking the door out of the clamps, sanding all the joints nice and, nice and smooth, and just knocking the edges down a bit. Next, I want to check the fit inside the case. Just drop it onto that bottom shelf, hold it tight up against the hinge side, with a nice even space at the top, and we'll have enough room for the hinges. Now, one thing I want to do is bevel this knob side of the door. It's a very traditional technique, and it allows a little extra clearance as it closes. Well, now we're ready to start making some moldings. And I'm going to start with this panel molding. I could try to make this with my router, but I wouldn't even come close to this profile. And it's a very classic look. Now, you're not going to find this molding down at the home center or even at a good lumber yard. You could go to a millwork company where they'd cut a set of knives and they'd run some stock for you. But there's a minimum charge for that. Now, we're lucky here in the workshop because we recently got a molding machine from a friend of the show. I'll show you how it works. I've taken off the dust collection. There's a motor down below that drives a cutter head. And what I did is I faxed a section of the profile of the molding up to the manufacturer, and they cut these two knives. When the knives come back here, I simply bolt them into the head. And then I create this little guide system made out of some plywood and stops that's clamped to the bed. And it just guides the square or rough stock through the machine. There's an in-feed roller which pushes it through the knives. Does a great job. All right, that should be enough to wrap the panels. While I have that set of knives in the molder, I'm going to run a thicker piece of stock, same profile, to wrap the mirror. All right, piece number one to wrap these panels. The molding gets mitered at the corners. I'll just secure these in place with some brads, no glue, and I don't want to nail through the panel. I want it to be able to move. To mortise out for my hinges, I'm using a homemade template, a collar on my router, and a straight cutting bit. Nothing fancy here, just two and a half inch brass plated butt hinges. These little plywood stops will prevent the door from going past the face frame. With my dado, I'm able to make a rabbit on the back side of the molding that's going to overlap the mirror. I'm only going to install three sides now. After the piece is finished, we'll slide the mirror in and install the last piece. Okay, well now I'm starting to 
install the decorative crown, which goes right under the edge of the top. I made this with another set of knives for our new molding machine. And I'm mitering the corners. And there's a little trick to that. The first thing that I do is take a piece of scrap wood and rip it to width equal to the distance from the bottom of the crown to the top of the crown. Then I use that as a gauge at the miter box. The gauge goes against the back fence of the miter box. Now here's the molding. This is the top. This is the bottom. I flip it over so that it's upside down. And then I bring it right even with the top of that block. Now, if it was too low, you can see my mark that I want to cut to, it would make the long point too long. And if it was too high, it would make it too short. This makes it just right. Okay, now we set it in place. And you can see how nicely that fits. Now for the base. First, some square stock glued and biscuited at mitered corners. And now the final piece of decoration, a little base molding. After that, we'll do a little touch-up sanding, and this piece will be ready for the finishing room. The first step in the finishing is to prime the interior. I'm using a high-quality alkyd base primer. Once this is dry, I'll give it a light sanding. And the finished coat will be a high-class latex enamel. Well, now for the pine. We're using one of our favorite finishes. It's a combination of stain and polyurethane. It's a satin finish. I put on at least three coats with a light sanding between each. And when the piece is all done, Boy, there's no better look for this antique pine. All right, well, there it is, with the mirror installed and a coat of white latex paint on the inside. This is a very useful project. They didn't exist historically, but I think a lot of people are going to want them.